Happy New Year and welcome to a very special episode of Palace Confidential. For the start of the year, we've got something a bit different for you. We've asked our experts to look into their crystal ball for what we can look forward to in the royal news this year, from the Cambridges to the New King to, of course, the Sussexes. Here is the Daily Mail's editor-at-large, Richard Kay, on what he thinks the New King's priorities will be next year. Well, I think we were all slightly uh, uh, astonished by the speed of change after Her Majesty the Queen died in September. Um, Charles was proclaimed king, he made a speech to the nation, he then went on a, on a tour of all points of his kingdom and it all happened so quickly and also one other thing he did of course was to um, make William Prince of Wales and I think we, we sort of began to think that things were going to happen really quickly, that Char here was a man, a king in a hurry if you like, but in the three months since he's slightly uh, taken his foot off the accelerator and I think what we're going to see are more incremental changes. His main focus is obviously going to be on the coronation in May, but we know he's got things, he's itching to change, uh, things that he thinks will sort of improve the connection, if you like, between the people and the crown. And one of those, I know, is his attitude towards honours. And, I mean, it may not affect everyone in the land, but we all know someone who's received an honour, and it, it is probably one of the greatest days of their lives when they go to Buckingham Palace or to Windsor Castle to receive their honour, their honour from the monarch. And I think that what he's got in mind is A, he's very open to the possibility of, of actually changing the names of them. So there's, there is something slightly antediluvian about the OBE, Order of the British Empire. Might that come the Order of British Excellence? Those are the kind of things he's been looking at, but also making the day that pe people receive their honours, more of a celebration for them so it lasts long in the memory. Those are things which I think he could do quite easily. Um, obviously we're not going to see his face on the banknotes for another year, not till 2024, so we've got a bit of time still to get used to that. Um, having said that, he wants to travel. We know he's going to have a major Commonwealth tour next year, um, but I think mostly he's going to be wanting to get around the United Kingdom. If it is his intention to slim down the monarchy, and, and we've been, I've been led to believe that for something like 25 years, um, then he will have to come to terms with the fact that a, a slimmer monarchy means it can do fewer things, can't stretch quite so far, can't visit all the realms all the time. So he's got to m manage that level of expectation. Now, I know what you're thinking. It would not be a palace compilation show without the one and only Richard Eden. So here is the Daily Mail's diary editor giving us his thoughts on what 2023 might look like for the Sussexes. Well, 2023 has really started with a bang for Harry and Meghan. Today, we've seen the first leaks from Harry's book, Spare, which is due to be published next Tuesday. And these leaks, my goodness, they're explosive. One of them, which was leaked to the Guardian newspaper, which is a Republican anti-monarchist newspaper, um, details a physical altercation fight that Harry had with William. Um, William turned up at Nottingham Cottage, the, the, the home that Harry and Meghan were staying in the grounds of Kensington Palace, and he confronted, William confronted Harry about Meghan's behaviour. Um, the words that Harry used are um, they're difficult, abrasive, words like this that he was talking about Meghan, and that seemed to enrage Harry. And then things escalated to the extent whereby William grabbed him by the collar, ripping off his necklace, I'm not sure what necklace it was, but this necklace broke, and then during this altercation, Harry was struck to the ground, he says, or fell to the ground, fell on a ceramic dog bowl, which was the shards were going into his back, and it's a really dramatic account. And of course, it's completely one-sided. We haven't heard Prince William's side of this. It could be very different indeed, but it's, it's really bad. You know, we knew things were bad between them. We knew they'd had arguments, but we never knew things had got to this physical level. And it's really extraordinary. And to be clear, you know, if this happened to me in the street now, this would be an assault. This would, and with the injury, it would probably be actual bodily harm. You know, th this is really serious stuff. What's so terribly unfair about this, and we will see this with the book in general, is it's a completely one-sided account. Kensington Palace, Buckingham Palace, they've made clear that they're not going to comment because they don't want to get into a he said, he said type row. 
so but these are going to be left hanging and it's just like with the Oprah Winter, uh, Winfrey interview where she, he made these serious allegations and they were left hanging against the royal family. So it's, it's very damaging and grossly unfair. What wasn't said in this um, leaked extract published by The Guardian was the context around this altercation. Remember that this was the time um, we know there were allegations of bullying being made against Meghan by members of their staff. And these were staff that were shared between William and Catherine and Harry and Meghan. And we've heard in the past how there was um, great disquiet with William and Catherine about how staff were being treated. And it sounds like that may have been the reason why William went round there. So, you know, the reason he was very concerned about what was going on, about Meghan's behaviour, was because of these allegations against his staff. So I think that really does put a different complexion on things. This leak to The Guardian wasn't the only one. There's also been a leak, despite all this great security we've heard about, there's also a leak to The New York Post, which relates back to that old instant, um, you might remember where Harry um, dressed up in for a fancy dress party in a Nazi uniform. Now, what he says in his book is that he did it. It wasn't just him. He was advised to wear this um, costume by William and Catherine. It's pathetic, isn't it? You know, it's like a child in a playground. It's, you know, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. They told me to do it. I mean, he was a grown man at the time. He was an adult. Surely we can decide what we wear to a, to a party. So it really, I must admit, when I heard this on the radio this morning, I laughed out loud. I thought it was <laughs> quite sad. I mean, what's astonishing is this time of year, January, is usually a time of relaxation for the royal family. You know, they're on holiday, and instead they're having to read this, hear this on a daily basis. You know, we've had two or three trailers already for interviews, and they certainly seem to be interesting. You know, we've had Harry accusing the royal family of refusing to make it up to him, refusing to reconcile, um, and he's clearly referring to incidents like this one with Prince William. But my goodness, you know, what is going to be First we've got the interviews, and then two days later we're going to have the book. So it sounds like there's going to be so much to have to deal with. It could stretch on, you know, way towards the coronation, which is May. And Harry makes clear in one of these interviews that he hasn't decided whether to attend the coronation or not. On the one hand, they love to attend the royal events, Harry and Meghan do. It shows they're still part of the royal family. You know, it's good for future business. Um, but remember that the coronation is different. It's not like the Queen's funeral. At the coronation, he will be there to swear his allegiance to the new monarch. He will be seated separately from Meghan because all the, the dukes and the lords who will be swearing allegiance will be seated together. And that's a big thing for him to have to do. Is he really going to do that after hurling all these brickbats at the, the monarchy? Is he then going to sit there and swear allegiance? It's going to be fascinating to see. What's interesting is that Buckingham Palace sources have already made clear that Harry and Meghan will be invited to the coronation. I think um, Harry's father, the King, is keen to show that you know, he's magnanimous, he doesn't hold grudges, he wants both of his sons to be there. But you know, what we can see already is this start of the will they, won't they? And we've seen that before with Harry and Meghan, and I suspect this will drag on um, towards the coronation. I think they love the attention, they love that, um, all that focus on them, whether they'll go or not. Um, and it's, it will be interesting to see over coming months. The new Prince and Princess of Wales are taking on more responsibilities now, so here's the Daily Mail's Royal Editor Rebecca English on what we can expect from them this year. Well, they will have a big foreign trip coming up, um, and obviously they're doing that with kind of a new emphasis and a new focus mm. as, as now the kind of direct heir to the throne. Um, uh, what's interesting, I think, is they're going to marry this kind of new role with how they'd establish their existing role. So, you know, about this time of year, for example, we see a lot of these kind of royal engagements, league tables that people compile about. Is that like many, top trumps? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> how many engagements yeah. uh, someone does. And it's interesting because the Prince and Princess of Wales are all tend to be lower down the scale of the number of engagements you see members of the royal family doing. But their office has always argued that actually we kind of want to do these jobs in a 
in a different way. We don't want to go around cutting ribbons and unveiling plaques every week. We want to do what they call kind of meaningful engagement. Oh, that's so a good spin. Okay. I hate the word impactful. <laughs> it's my it's, it's yeah. a trigger word for me. I think it's such a kind of slack word. But yeah, they it, they want it to be impactful, i.e., to um, have uh, dealings with a fewer number of organisations, but get to know the people a bit better. And of course, they are you know renowned as very hands-on parents, is, which I, I suppose is part of it. But do you think we will start to see more of the children in the new year? On a limited basis. I mean, this is something, and it's, it's probably worthy of a discussion another programme, I think, as well, because that was the one thing for William when he became a father, was to be able to ring fence his children so they didn't have the kind of childhood that he had. And, once, and that's taken a few years in terms of, you know, also working with the media to establish, you know, people don't use paparazzi pictures of the children and to make sure they're protected while they go to and from school. And when I say the media, I don't just mean newspapers, I mean television, radio, you know, everything. Um, and so once he'd established that, which he has done now, I think he feels in quite a comfortable position to maybe just let the light shine on them a little bit more in a controlled way. But again, it's going to be what they feel comfortable with. It's also, it's a, it's a fine line, isn't it? Because those children inevitably have to get used to being in the public eye to a large extent. Exactly, and I yeah. know George has struggled with that a bit more, but mm. Charlotte, I mean, she is a future superstar. <laughs> I mean, you can't take her eyes off her when she's on engagements. And, you know, she's the one telling her brothers, right, this is where you wave, this is where you bow, this is where you... Do. I mean, she. I feel like she's the Princess Anne in the making. Aww. She's the number, yeah. you know, she's going to be, yeah, she's going to be one to watch. Aww. Here's Robert Hardman now on what we can expect from the coronation of His Majesty the King in May. Coronation for uh, central part of the royal story. It's actually the oldest of all the royal traditions we have. It goes back to the 10th century. The earliest coronation we know of is King Edgar at Bath. Um, and actually this is not really any different from that uh, in, in, in the central elements. All coronations have these crucial parts. They have the recognition where everyone accepts this is our new monarch and there is the uh, anointing which goes back to sort of biblical times there's a crowning and there's a homage where we all go this is our monarch and we in this case you know we we, we recognize you know god save the king or uh, god save the queen as of course they cried in 1953 so in that regard it's not going to be very different from all those that have gone before but of course each one is slightly different. It has to reflect the spirit of the times. Um, in 1953, the Queen's coronation, while part of a great kind of post-war revival, this idea of a sort of, uh, almost a, a sort of nation reborn out of the rubble of the war, uh, it was still a very traditional one in that the, the central roles were essentially hereditary. It was a very aristocratic affair. I think in that regard, this one will be different. I don't think we'll have huge uh, numbers of um, hereditary peers. Might have a handful here and there, but overall, it's going to be um, very much in keeping with the 21st century. I think it'll be diverse. I think it will have a smaller congregation. It has to. I mean, heavens! In uh, 1953, they managed to cram more than 8,000 people into Westminster Abbey. They built scaffolding everywhere they could gantries, packing them to the rafters. The BBC even had to select its TV cameraman uh, on the basis of height. They wanted the smallest cameraman they could find so they could squeeze them into these tiny spaces. Uh, this time they're not going to be putting in any extra seating. It'll be about two and a half thousand people max. Um, and it will be a cross-section of British life. Um, the uh, Lords and the Commons will be there, but it'll have, they'll have to have a lottery. They certainly won't have all of them there. Um, and uh, it'll be the same right the way through the diplomatic corps, all the arms of the state. They're going to have to, um, you know, get, get representative samples. Uh, but you know, in essence, it's the same as it's always been. It's about um, welcoming in a new reign and uh, paying homage to a new monarch. That's all we have time for on Palace Confidential today. My thanks to today's contributors and wishing you all a very happy new year and we will see you for a regular programme next week. Bye for now.